Hi everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com. So this is the part 6 of ovarian tumor series and in this part we shall learn about sex cord stromal tumors. If you are new to this video, what we had discussed in the earlier sessions were we looked into the classification of ovarian tumors which, which was classified into you know, surface epithelial stromal tumors, germ cell tumors, sex cord stromal tumors, metastatic tumors and miscellaneous tumors and we had discussed in detail about all the surface epithelial tumors we discussed all germ cell tumors and in today's session we will be looking at sex cord stromal tumors so in the next 15 minutes we look into the general aspects of sex cord stromal tumors we will look into the classification of sex cord stromal tumors and then in detail about the important sex cord stromal tumors though i don't I will not be covering all the tumors. We will be discussing only about the granulosa cell tumors, fibromas and thecomas, and a bit about Sertoli Ledic cell tumor. What are sex cords? So, if you remember your embryology, sex cords are basically they are they are the structures in the developing gonad, and the gonads could be ovaries or testes. In this case, we are looking at sex cords of the ovaries, and what do they do? They play a very crucial role in the formation of reproductive cells and tissues. So, let us quickly recollect what we had learnt in embryology. So, during early development, you know, what happens, you know, these sex cords, they develop as proliferations or extensions of coelomic epithelium that lines the gonadal ridge. Okay. So, this is a section of embryo and that is the uh, primitive gut, that is the notochord. So, this is what is the genital ridge. This thickening what you see is the genital ridge. So, this genital ridge is medial to the mesonephros. So, this part is mesonephros where the kidneys would develop, right? So, medial part of the mesonephros nephros is the genital ridge, right? So, if you look at the histological picture of this particular part, what we see is so, it is also lined by the coelomic epithelium. So, that is a coelomic epithelium. But in part of genital ridge, this coelomic epithelium is thickened. Okay. So, that is what we need to understand that. See, these uh, sex cords initially, they appear as proliferation of the coelomic epithelium, which penetrate into the underlying mesenchyme. Okay. So, that is the mesenchyme in the genital ridge. So, these small round you know, dots are basically the germ cells which migrate towards the developing gonad. So, basically what are sex cords? These are clusters or cords of cells which extend into the developing ovary. So, basically they are thickened coelomic epithelium which extend into the develop, developing ovary, right? So, over time what happens, you know, these cords, they no longer remain as cords but then they get fragmented. Okay, they get fragmented or breaks up into small, small clusters, okay, which lines the periphery of the ovary, that is a cortex. So, medullary, in the, in the medullary region, the cords disintegrate, whereas in the cortical region, the cords, you know, they form fragments, they get fragmented and then each of these fragments or each of these cluster surrounds a oocyte. So, oocyte will be in the center, surrounding that is the sex cord which are now fragmented or in the form of clusters. So, this oocyte is a germ cell and surrounding that is a sex cord cells and that, these sex cords are the ones which later on become granulosa cells. The primary function of these granulosa cells is to protect and nurture the central oocyte. So, those are sex cord cells. Now, what are stromal cells? In between these clusters of sex cords are the stromal component. Okay? Some of these stromal component, they differentiate into another type of epithelium called theca cells. And of course, there are also fibroblasts. So, the adjacent cells are nothing but the stromal cells. Now, the tumors what we are discussing now are sex cord stromal cells which means the tumor which is derived from the cells of the sex cords what are those granulosa cells and the stroma what are those stromal cells which could be fibroblasts derivatives of stromal cells into theca cells so we are looking at granulosa cells theca cells and fibroblast like cells so let us let, let's now look into what are all the cells which forms the uh, sex cord and stroma the first one is a granulosa cell as we all know 
they are derived from the proliferative epithelium of the developing gonad and they are involved in follicle formation and estrogen production. That is the main function of granulosa cell is to produce estrogen. In contrast, theca cells, they are derived from ovarian stromal cells. Okay, they differentiate from stromal cells. The main function is to produce androgen, though it produces androgen, but in coordination, in cooperation with the adjacent granulosa cells, it form, it goes on to form the estrogen. So, the function of granulosa and theca cells is primarily production of estrogen. The third important cell is the Sertoli cells. Okay, Sertoli cells are not to be seen in females, you know, in ovaries. They are mainly derived from testicular sex cords in males. But sometimes in some ovarian tumors, the cells resemble Sertoli cells, you know, they can be seen. Okay, that is Sertoli cells. Whereas Leydig cells, Leydig cells are derived from the interstitial cells of the testis. Remember, in the testis they are found. But in ovaries they are not normally found. But then in certain ovarian tumors, the cells resembling Leydig cells can be seen. The main function of Leydig cells are again producing androgen. In, in males, they produce testosterone. So, now you know Sertoli cells are purely derived from sex cords. Leydig cells are derived from the stroma, that means the interstitial cells. Apart from these four types of cells, the last uh, type of cells is obviously the stromal cell, which are fibroblasts, which can be found throughout the body, including the ovarian stroma. So, the term tumors derived from these fibroblasts could be fibromas or even fibrosarcomas. Most often they are fibromas, which is benign tumor. Okay, now, now the classification of sex cord stromal tumors is very, very simple, right? So, they are classified into pure sex cord tumors. They are classified into pure sex cord tumors, pure stromal tumors and then mixture of these two and they are called as mixed tumors. Now, it's easy to know what are these pure sex cord tumors, right? They are granulosa cell tumors, they are Sertoli cell tumors, and the third one, very rare, it's called sex cord stromal tumors with annular tubules. So, granulosa cell tumors are further categorized into adult and juvenile based on the age of occurrence of these tumors. Moving on to pure stromal tumors, which are derived from the stromal elements, they are fibromas, thecomas, because we know theca cells are actually, you know, they are modification of the stromal cells, right? So, fibromas, thecomas, combination of these two, fibrothecoma, lydic cell tumor, other tumors include steroid cell tumor, sclerosing stromal tumor and fibrosarcoma, which is the malignant counterpart of fibromas. And the mixed tumor are combination of pure sex cord and stroma, which includes sertoli, and Leydig. So, Sertoli Leydig cell tumors and another rare tumor called sex cord stromal tumor NOS meaning not otherwise specified. So, let us look into each of these tumors in detail. The first one is granulosa cell tumors. These are the tumors which are composed of cells resemble granulosa cells of a developing ovarian follicle and we all know that these granulosa cells are basically derived from the sex cords, right? So, they are again classified into adult and juvenile based on the age. It constitutes around 5% of ovarian tumors and 95% of all granulosa cell tumors are of adult type. Only around 5% are juvenile type of granulosa cell tumor. So, if you do a molecular analysis in these patients, 97% of these tumors, particularly adult granulosa cell tumors, they have these FOXL2 gene mutation. Okay? And they are less common or even absent in the juvenile type. So, that means to say that juvenile type uh, granulosa cell tumor has a different pathogenetic mechanism uh, uh, than what we see in adult type of granulosa cell tumors. Now, why are these tumors important? That is the next question you need to answer, right? So, what these granular cell tumors are important because they elaborate large amounts of estrogen okay. and also they may behave like low-grade malignancies. Now, what happens if there is large amount of estrogen in the human body? So, it depends upon in which age group the large amount of estrogen is there. The um, precocious sexual development 
is a manifestation of these tumors if it is found in children. In case if it is adults, or the manifestations of increased estrogen are in the form of proliferative breast disease because these are responsive, hormonal responsive, right? Estrogen responsive, proliferative breast disease, endometrial hyperplasia, and even endometrial carcinomas can be seen in adult adults with granulosa cell tumors. Very rarely, granulosa cell tumors can produce androgens too. Right? The likelihood of malignant behavior in the form of recurrence or even extension or even spread can be seen in these granulosa cell tumors. But the incidence of it behaving as low-grade malignancy is around 5 to 25% of cases. Morphologically, granulosa cell tumors, most often they are unilateral tumor. They can be a very small foci. They, are, they can be microscopic foci to large solid and cystic encapsulated masses. Sometimes the cut section may be yellow and that's because of the presence of lipids. These are uh, hormonally active tumors which contain a lot of these lipids and that's how the cut surface looks yellowish in color. Microscopically, the granulosa cell tumors have different patterns. They are composed of cells which are small, cuboidal to polygonal cells. They can grow in anastomosing cords. They can grow in sheets or even strands. Sometimes you can find these gland-like structures. This is what you are looking at, right? These are gland-like structures which are filled with an acidophilic material. And these, you know, they represent or they look like immature follicles. These are very classically referred to as Carl Exner bodies. If you see Carl Exner bodies, you are almost sure that you are looking at granulosa cell tumor. That's a higher magnification of showing, you know, these gland-like structures filled with acidophilic material. These are Carl Exner bodies. So, that's a higher magnification of each of these nuclei. The very characteristic feature of the nuclei is, look at these longitudinal groove. Right? Can you see that? Longitudinal groove. And this is a coffee bean appearance. Just like what you saw in Brenner's tumor, even in adult granulosa cell tumor, you can find these coffee bean nuclei type of nuclei. So, that's an illustration of, you know, Carl Exner bodies. Carl Exner is named after Carl, who was an American obstetrician, and Exner, who was an Austrian physiologist and psychologist. So, these are pathognomonic of adult granulosa cell tumors, not juvenile. Remember, these are pathognomonic of adult granulosa cell tumors. They contain amorphous eosinophilic PAS, periodic acid shift positive hyaline material in the center. And these are the granulosa cells with coffee bean nuclei. Okay. So, what are these central bodies? They are basically membrane packaged secretion of these granulosa cells. Though it is pathognomonic of adult granulosa cell tumors, similar kind of bodies can be seen in gonadoblastomas, granulosa cell tumor like variant of endometrioid carcinoma. So, that's about Carl Exner bodies. The next one is luteinized adult granulosa cell tumor is another variant where the cells have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and then they lack the typical grood nuclei. You don't see much of grood nuclei. All you can see is prominent nucleola here. But what is more striking is they have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, serum marker, serum levels of inhibin are increased and immunohistochemically also it stains positive for inhibin and that's very useful in diagnosing and monitoring these patients who are on treatment. So, sometimes special stains can also be used in granulosa cell tumor and one particular stain is reticulin stain where the reticulin fibers are seen which are seen surrounding the groups of these granulosa cells. So, this is called as nested pattern, particularly in case of reticulin stained slides of granulosa cell tumors. So, moving on to juvenile granulosa cell tumor, they occur in the first three decades of life. As I told you, in children, because of increased estrogen, they typically present as isosexual pseudo precocity in prepubertal girls. In reproductive age women, they can be manifested as abdominal swelling, pain, pelvic mass or even menstrual irregularities. Microscopically, you know, they can be diffuse or nodular, very less frequently follicular architecture. You don't find Carl Exner bodies. If at all, you find they are very, very rare. The cells are having abundant to, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. 
and they don't have grew like what you saw in adult granulosa cell tumors right remember they are different tumors as compared to adult granulosa cell tumor you don't find collex cell bodies you don't find typically grooved nuclei as you saw in adult granulosa cell tumors that is all so that's about uh, one of the important pure sex cord tumors now move on to uh, let's move on to pure stromal tumors right so pure to stromal tumors first one is fibroma which is composed of fibroblasts trichomas which is composed of Theca cells, which are nothing but the plump spindle cells with lipid droplets. Remember, thecomas are tumors of theca cells, and theca cells are derivatives of the stromal cells, right? And then combination fibro thecoma. That's a mixture of the above two. Right? So why it is important to note that the fibromas, the pure fibromas, are hormonally inactive tumors, whereas these two categories are hormonally active tumors. So let's look into fibroma. They are often unilateral, solid, lobulated mass. They usually present with pelvic mass, with or without pain. But the most important thing you need to remember is the two associations with fibromas. One is called Meigs syndrome. Another is called basal cell nervous syndrome. What is this Meigs syndrome? These patients will have ascites, right-sided hydrothorax along with fibroma. The genesis of this kind of association is unknown basically, whereas another one is basal cell nervous syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant where you have patched one mutation. The findings in these cases are you have basal cell carcinoma, you have cysts in the jaw, you have cardiac fibromas and also fibromas of the ovary. Right. So, this is basal cell nervous syndrome. Remember, two associations, Meigs and basal cell nervous syndrome. So, that's about uh, important pure stromal tumors. Moving on to mixed tumors, that's certainly leading cell tumors. And these cells, you know, they recapitulate. I told you, you don't find normally sertoli cells, you don't find normally leading cells in ovary, right? But then in tumors, you can find cells similar to these sertoli and leading cells. That's why cells recapitulate the, to a certain extent, testicular sertoli or leading cells at various stages of development. And what is important to note that these are functional tumors. At this point, I would like to tell you that almost all, most of the sex cord stromal tumors are functional tumors. If you are asked what are functional tumors of ovary, you should talk about only sex cord stromal tumors. Now, certainly leading cell tumors are also functional. They most commonly produce masculinization or defeminization. Okay, what does what does that mean? You mean the patients might present with features of hirsutism, which means you know they are associated with male type of hair distribution, hypertrophy of the clitoris, and voice changes. Or they can be uh, defeminization in the form of atrophy of the breast, amenorrhea sterility and loss of hair. That's how these patients might manifest. Very rarely, they also might have estrogenic effects. They are often found in second to third decades of life. What you found, find in molecular pathology is mutations in the DICER-1 gene. And that's a gene which encodes an endonuclease that is essential for proper functioning of the microRNAs. You just remember, Sertoli leading cell tumors, mutation, what you find is DICER-1 gene mutation. So, uh, morphologically, they are most often unilateral. They resemble adult granulosa cell tumors very grossly. They are solid, grey to golden brown in colour. On microscopically, you have three different patterns. One is well differentiated, another is moderately differentiated and third one is poorly differentiated. What do you mean by well differentiated? They have tubules which are composed of Sertoli cells or leading cells interspersed with the stroma. They just look like normal Sertoli and leading cells. Okay? Whereas moderately differentiated, you have immature tubules and large eosinophilic leading cells. They don't look like normal ones. That's why they are moderately differentiated. Whereas poorly differentiated one, they have a sarcomatous pattern. They look like a sarcomas with a disorderly disposition of epithelial cell cords. Okay. Leading cells may be absent in these cases, but then what is important to note that they are poorly differentiated tumors. So that's all about the sex cord stromal tumors. I think we have covered the uh, very important aspects of sex cord stromal tumors. We looked into what sex cords are and that's how uh, we understood the concept of classification of these sex cord stromal tumors. And then we looked into 
the important six called stromal tumors like granulosa cell tumors, fibromas and thecomas, and sertoliliac cell tumors. Thank you for watching. Do comment if you have any queries to ask. I am repeatedly telling that you know your comments are the ones which motivates me to produce more and more videos. Do not forget to subscribe if you find this video useful. Don't forget to share if you feel this is worth sharing. Thank you.